Let's face it, we hate talking about death. Since death has become more medicalized and it seems to happen most often behind closed doors, we've really lost the knowledge around how to companion people at end of life. But some experts are trying to change that. Most people will spend more time researching their phone plans than they will thinking at all about the reality of their own impending death. On today's show, Reinventing Death. In Canada, our understanding of the ins and outs of dying is at an all-time low. The commercialization of death care has brought the whole process out of our homes and cultural consciousness. On today's show, I'm going to be having conversations with a new wave of death care providers who are seeking to change our understanding of end of life. I'm hoping to learn how death works and how we can plan for our own passing. My first visit will be with Krista Ovenal. She's a mortician and a death care educator who's trying to help us understand death. She left a successful career in education to follow her passion. I moved into end of life or after death care with the sole intention of being part of the, the crew, the team, if you will, that's revolutionizing death care. I didn't like what I saw in a lot of the corporate spaces and the corporate settings. And so we've removed it from just the natural arc of life and we've removed it from families. Because one of your sayings that I thought that stuck with me is that well, we're doing death wrong. Right. So we're doing death wrong. So what are we doing wrong and what do we need to make it right? I think we need to get back to basics in a lot of ways and I think we need to stop being afraid. We invited the morticians in about a hundred years ago, 150 years ago maybe, so not that long. But morticians came in and they said you know we can help with that but what they did is they removed death from the fabric of day-to-day -day life and and they took it to their sort of beige funeral homes and they they said don't come in here because we've got this we're going to take care of this for you but then what happened is we lost a sense of very practically speaking what happens when you die when facing death, some people turn to end-of-life doulas. This relatively new profession provides companionship and guidance to the terminally ill. Tracy Chalmers heard the call to death care several years ago. So years ago, I was volunteering at Lionsgate Hospital and they assigned me to palliative care. So it was the first time that I had seen people that were dying and watched the process of dying and like most people, I went into that experience absolutely terrified. I was terrified to cross the thresholds of those rooms. So that sort of initiated my interest. So tell me, what does a death doula do? So when do I call you and like how, what, how does that happen? So there's two different points that people reach out to death doulas. Um, one is perfectly healthy people that just want to do their end of life planning. And then the other um, point of contact is when someone has a terminal diagnosis. And it's either a person who is at the end of life or their family that reaches out. And usually it's because they're overwhelmed. You were saying that you hope that someday we don't need death do less. You're trying to put yourself out of business. Yes. <laughs> um, I am, in fact, because I think that we, we all have what it takes to show up for each other at end of life. We have this. And I mean, up until about 100 years ago, we, we did this. Now, since death has become more medicalized and it seems to happen most often behind closed doors, we've really lost um, the, the knowledge around how to companion people at end of life. I'm going to have you educate me a little bit. Okay. If you would. Sure. On your experience and the many times that you've had the privilege of being with the families and with someone that is dying, mm -hmm. what, what's the common denominator? Like, what do we say? What do we want? What do we remember? What's the truth okay. at that moment? 
So there was a beautiful book written by Dr. Ira Biok. He's a palliative care physician in, uh, from the U.S. And it's called The Four Things That Matter Most. And he believes in all his years of companioning the dying as a palliative care physician that really at end of life, people want to hear, I forgive you, please forgive me, I'm grateful for, so an expression of gratitude, and lastly, I love you. And of all the beds I've been at, it's always the same. At end of life, it's always about love. And the dying always ask two questions. Was I loved enough? And did I love enough? It all comes down to love. But what happens when someone we love finally lets go? When a death occurs at home, it can be so peaceful and it can provide so much opportunity for kind of control of the situation and an ability to not have to rush. I've been on a journey to learn about end of life. I'm curious, what happens to our bodies in the hours after death? The ultimate dream is to age at home, and die, and die at home. At home. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the process because that would be the one where the person, the family would have most hands on. For sure, right? absolutely. When a death occurs at home, it can be uh, so peaceful and it can provide so much opportunity for kind of control of the situation and an ability to not have to rush. You would have to have something called an expected death in the home form. And then what that means is that when the death occurs, you don't have to call 911. You don't have to involve the police. There's not ambulances rushing forward and again, creating chaos. It can be very peaceful when it is an expected death that is registered as an expected death. It's time now to call the funeral home. And a good funeral home will, will help you take your time. Should we be so lucky as to pass peacefully at home, our first stop will be the funeral home. Emily and Nayo are first-generation funeral directors who, like Krista, saw an opportunity to redefine the end-of-life experience. They run Koru, a funeral home that focuses on cremation and green burials. I did my bachelor's degree in psychology and I volunteered with victim services through the RCMP and so I learned that when somebody dies as a part of my training that basically the point of contact after a death is a funeral home. There's nobody else that you call. You talk to a funeral director and it was like, like a light bulb for me. Describe to me the work. What happens exactly in your office? We collect, you know, legal name of the deceased, where they've died, where um, are they still in that place? Who has pronounced the death? What's their date of birth? Um, what's their approximate weight? Um, if the person calling is not the executor, then who is that and how do we contact them? So those are kind of the first bunch of questions that we'll start with. And then it goes from there. Then we're talking about uh, transportation needs. Will that need to happen right away? A big emphasis we make is just on people taking time. And so just informing people that, you know, someone can rest there for several hours, no problem. And so if people need to come in and spend time with them before we move their body, then by all means. If their person has come into our care and they haven't had an opportunity to really interact with their person after they've died, we'll want to explore that with them. Do you want to come here and help to bathe them or, um, or maybe just dress them? The family's working with us. And so I would say, you know, the bathing room, when we picked the colors, when we picked the, you know, cabinets, we did that with the intention that we would be bringing families in. So it's not just a space for us to do our work. It's also a space where I can be comfortable saying, do you want to come in and participate in this with me? This is um, an eco cremation tray. So they're locally made in Abbotsford. It's just natural pine as a base and then cardboard for the top. And then you'll see even the ties that will eventually tie the cardboard on. It's just natural fiber uh, rope. You both have a very wonderful vibe, like friends taking care of you. Not only are you women, but you certainly have a great disposition for this business. It's yeah. not for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. 
no, uh, yeah. this is hard work. You're doing this because you're called to do it, and it's just what you need to be doing. And uh, if, if that is not a part of why you're doing it, you can't do the work. Faith can anchor us when we're faced with the inevitable. And every culture has their own way of dealing with death and dying. When a person passed away, traditionally, the body would then be taken back to their home. And so the extended family then gathers and they spend the evening with the deceased. So far, we've been meeting with experts who are redefining death. But what about some of our ancient traditions? Every faith has a different view on death and dying. I sent videographer Dee Natwal to learn how other religions grapple with death. Regardless of how or where we are born, what unites people globally is the fact that we all eventually die. However, conceptions about death and how we respond to issues of death vary widely between cultures. Uh, when a person passed away, traditionally, mm -hmm. the body would then be taken back to their home and they would be resting in their home. And so the, the extended family then gathers. It's, it's like a vigil. In Japanese, we call it the otsuya. Tsuya means through the night. Otsuya. Otsuya. How we are different than others are, number one, burning. We burn the body. We do not preserve them. We do not put into the earth because we believe that it has to finish. And in Hinduism, there is no restriction on donation of organs also. You can donate. Uh, this is again a good karma. The body has an end, but the soul will continue. The body will be buried. Remember, this body is a gift and a trust from God, from Allah. So we now we must return it back to him. The body leaves the hospital. First thing, the body will come be in the cold room. When the family decide the date and the hour of the burial, then the body leave the cold room straight to the washroom or to the bath to clean the body, where the body will be clean, washed, soaked, and the coffin and the shroud will be put for the body. And once the body is taken to the funeral home, there is a, a music band. So the body is taken by band that, hey, this person has done something good. Um, so mostly all Hindu families, I would say most of them, they go to India, uh, they go to Haridwar and Pohoha, they do the prayer there with the ashes, and then we put the ashes back into the river Ganges because that is a pure and very sacred uh, river that we believe in. In many of the Buddhist traditions, the view is that when the person passes away, they continue on a journey. And it's said for the first 49 day period, um, often the individual will visit the places that they associated with during while they were alive. What happens to a person once he leaves the body? What, what, what does Hinduism say happens to soul consciousness? Uh, the Hinduism believes in reincarnation. We believe that soul never dies. So this is the supreme and the perfect body, human body, where you can think, where you can speak, where you can act. And if you act good, you speak good, you go back to the God. Then you don't need to reborn again and again. Yes, we're in North America. And, and, but the beauty of North America is that we are multicultural. People are now beginning to see there was reason for why they did certain things. And I think they're seeing the beauty of, of many of these traditions. We've seen what happens with our body and perhaps our spirit in the moments after death. But what about our final resting place? They feel like they should come and pay respects, but it's so heavy duty. So if we can give them more than one reason to return to this place, that's how we can build a healthy relationship. Hi, I'm Chef Julian Bond. Come with me while I show you a few shopping hacks to save some money. Soup. 
When it comes to soup, you can buy dried soup, you can buy canned soup way over in the aisles. For me, go to the freezer section. There's no preservatives in here. And it's got ingredients you can read. There's not a single word here I can't pronounce. You get what you pay for, and this is high quality product. We're gonna stretch this a little bit by adding some frozen vegetables, and we're gonna put inside a beautiful sourdough bread bowl. Awesome. Here's my tip. Buy your vegetables from the freezer section. Nutritionally, the frozen vegetables have far better nutrition than the five-day-old carrot that came out of the ground. A good example of that is spinach. Personally, I like this block spinach because I go through a lot of spinach. But if you want to save money, buy your spinach IQF frozen. You can just take out as much as you need for that stew or that lovely little stir fry, close it up, put it back in your freezer, and you're good to go. The sourdough bread bowl. We're gonna go in and just cut that top off. And then all that bread in there, we're actually just gonna take your fingers and we're going to pull it right up, big chunks. And then your bread that you have left over, put those on a baking sheet, drizzle with a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper, and you have something that looks like this. Crispy, hard. I'm gonna decorate our soup with them today. And this is the New England style clam chowder from Organic Ocean, and it's full of clams. So, easiest meal you're ever gonna cook for four people. So we're gonna take our soup. Now, because this is a clam soup, I don't want it to boil, boil, boil. And using my spatula, just gonna very slowly bring this gorgeous soup up to temperature. It's gonna take about eight minutes, our IQF spinach. Add a lot of peas. Butternut squash. And away you go. Incorporate the squash, the spinach, and those peas. There's clams in every ladle. There's squash. Amazing. Everybody's gonna have full bellies to finish their day. Krista has taken us on a journey through death and dying. Now there's only one step left, laying our remains to rest. One thing I've heard more than once is the phrase green burial. One of only two certified green burial cemeteries in the Lower Mainland is Heritage Gardens in South Surrey. Founder Trevor Crean's family has been in the funeral business for over four generations, but he decided to do things a little bit differently. The last cemetery before us to open was Gardens of Gethsemane, the Catholic Archdiocese in the 60s. So we're the first new cemetery to open in Metro Vancouver in like 50 years. This is our green burial garden, and uh, this is the one following the criteria from the Green Burial Society. Families um, purchase a reservation to this garden, so you don't actually buy a specific grave, and then we conduct the burials from east to west so that we kind of fill it up naturally along. There is a Green Burial Society of Canada and they lay out a uh, pretty strict criteria about what constitutes their green burial certification. No embalming, no cremated remains. The person laid to rest will not get a permanent headstone like you kind of see in traditional cemeteries. So it's kind of the vegan standard for burial. The rest of our cemetery, we encourage as eco-friendly and as natural a burial as possible, but we don't impose all of the restrictions. So we can kind of meet people where they're coming from. And so on either side of us, we have eight beehives on either edge of the property. Oh. Each set of hives oh. gets their own kind of meadow to, to work within. Like we're such a death denying culture yeah. that families don't know how to bring up, like they, they feel like they should come and pay respects. If we can give them more than one reason to return to this place, that's how we can build a healthy relationship with the memory like of our that. loved ones. The one through line I've heard today from all our experts is the importance of planning. Because when death occurs, making decisions in that moment can be paralyzing. Most people will spend more time researching their phone plans than they will thinking at all about the reality of their own impending death. 
is it almost like we're inviting death if we talk about it? And I think some people really believe that if we if we talk about it, it'll happen sooner. And I'm here to tell you, great news on that front. <laughs> <laughs> and what will happen is people will will default to um, to not making decisions. They'll be led. Maybe people have never heard. Um, about the fact that you could witness a cremation, for example. If you haven't talked about this in advance, then how are you going to take that information in? And later, you might say, okay, no, 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 I don't need to do that. But then three days later, you think, gosh, that actually would have been beautiful. Well, you know, I'm sitting here talking with you and you're talking about participating in the preparation of the body. And it kind of had like a light bulb moment in thinking, you know, there. I see faces in my life of people that I dearly love that I would do that for, that would motivate me beyond my fear to commune with them just possibly for the last time. That's so beautiful. It's just another sharing of your love for that person That's and exactly it takes right. away the fear. It does. Because your love takes over the fear. The one thing that struck me during the show is how right the experts are. Planning is everything. I know, my mother died suddenly and I was totally unprepared. I can't express to you the relief I felt when I learned that she had pre-planned and prepaid for everything. She wasn't planning to die, but she was ready. And that's the show. Remember, as our CARP chairman, Moses Neimer, always says, the best way to keep going is to keep going. So carpe diem and seize your day. Mm -hmm.